On today's episode of Agile Giants, I am thrilled to welcome Richard Clark, the Senior Vice President and Chief Analytics Officer at Highmark Health. I first met Richard during an executive education program at Tupper where I was teaching. Recently, we reconnected and discussed his career journey, and immediately I knew I had to have him on the show. During his eight-year tenure at Highmark, Richard's career offers a unique perspective into the dynamic world of analytics and data science. This conversation is relevant not just for leading healthcare organizations, but offers really valuable insights for leaders in various sectors. I'm super excited for this engaging discussion on Agile Giants and hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I do. So Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. As I said in the intro, I'm really excited about this conversation. I I did want to just start before we get to what you're doing at Highmark and some of the relevant questions. I think there's two context questions that are probably relevant for people. So the first one is about you. Could you talk a little bit about your academic background and your work background before you came to Highmark? Uh, yeah, be, be happy to. And uh, thanks so much for having me, Sean. I'm really excited for this conversation um, uh, as well. So uh, I always describe my career in kind of three phases, I guess. I had my academic phase, uh, so uh, PhD in uh, neuroscience from the Center for Neurobasis of Cognition at Pitt and CMU, uh, which was uh, amazing. I, I always joke with my uh, data scientists here, I was... Um, I was using R for all of my statistical analysis because I couldn't afford a MATLAB license, not because it was cool, but I guess now it's uh, come back around a bit, which is fun. Uh, I then uh, left academia and went into management consulting for um, uh, just shy of a decade at McKinsey & Company, uh, really focused on uh, application of advanced analytics in financial services, which was really fun because it was uh, a really fast moving time in that particular industry. And, uh, you know, the thesis of the, me then kind of coming to uh, Highmark, uh, you know, um, a health services company here in Pittsburgh was to bring some of that work that we had done in financial services into healthcare. And, you know, my real passion is around how do we uh, apply, um, you know, analytic insights, not uh, retrospectively, but kind of at the moment of decision making uh, inside of workflow to inform uh, you know, what we are doing to lead to better outcomes. And that was a lot of the work that we're doing in uh, financial services. And it's been a really fun run so far in uh, healthcare to do the same thing. Awesome. And and then the second part of this is a lot of people who listen to Agile Giants are not in Western Pennsylvania uh, or even in the sort of greater Highmark footprint. So maybe just a, a minute on who Highmark is, because I think that'll that'll help the rest of the conversation. Uh, yeah, I'd be, be happy to describe it. We are we do have a national footprint, so hopefully uh, at least some folks have uh, have heard of us. But as I said, we're a, a you know, diversified health services company. So uh, Highmark Health, uh, the parent company in, in the that's the uh, part of the organization that I am in, uh, really has, you know, kind of five business units, if you will. So um, the, the Highmark uh, Blue Branded Insurance Company, um, primary footprints in West Virginia, PA, uh, Delaware, and New York. Uh, about six million uh, insured lives. Uh, we also have our uh, uh, health system here in Western Pennsylvania that folks would know as Allegheny Health Network, uh, primarily operating you know from kind of Pittsburgh up through Erie and into Western New York uh, a little bit. We then have a couple of our diversified businesses, so National Dental Business, United Concordia Dental, uh, and our National Stop Loss Business, uh, uh, HMIG. And then finally, uh, and very importantly, our uh, technology platform, NGEN, which provides many of the platforms for the payvider space, so the uh, you know integration of payer and provider out to the market, uh, which really gives us a chance to scale some of the things that we're doing, both within uh, Highmark Health Plan as well as within Allegheny Health Network. Perfect. Okay, so now let's get to this eight-year journey that's I think probably just getting started, but where you've you've I think made analytics real in healthcare. So t- talk a little bit about sort of how even just your role to get started, we'll talk about projects in a minute, but just even your role is different today versus what it was maybe when you joined Highmark. Uh, yeah, it's uh, like you said, I, I do think in some ways uh, we've covered a lot of ground, but in some ways we are just getting started. Yeah. And and I really celebrate, um, you know, the leadership here at Highmark, uh, you know, David Holmberg, Karen Hanlon and others as kind of recognizing analytics as, um, uh, a key part of our strategic differentiation, a key part of our strategy. And so I've been really uh, lucky to 
have a role that is all about partnering with both our functional areas as well as our you know business segments to uh, ask that exact question how can we deploy analytics in a way that is um, in the workflow informing decision making and, th and thus uh, creating uh, you know advantage for us so we can succeed in the market and you know that role has uh, evolved for sure but I think what's been at the center of that from the beginning is this kind of translation so how can I really sit at the interface between the capabilities that we have which are always evolving and we'll talk about some of the uh, evolution, very rapid evolution over the, the past year. Uh, but really at the end of the day, it's still been about, well, how do we take those capabilities and then, you know, leverage them to enable us to uh, get the outcomes that we want. So I'll often get the question, well, do you have an AI strategy? And I was like, well, you know, we, we don't have a, a defined AI strategy right. necessarily. What we have is, uh, you know, our strategy is to uh, achieve our business strategy with, through the use of AI. And that, that to me, while a subtle distinction is really important, and I think has really been, uh, you know, kind of a consistent thread throughout the eight years. Yeah, I, I love that, right? So it, it feels a little bit like the internet, like people had internet strategies at one point, and now they have business strategies. I think AI is that kind of a, a, a similar point, like people want to understand this AI, it's like, look, what we want is to delight customers, do it better, right? Like that's, you know, and we're gonna use this, these new capabilities, capabilities to do it. Now, my intuition is when you joined Highmark, there was probably more evangelism around that than there is today. But I think you also put some wins on the board pretty quickly early on that sort of set the tone. Maybe before we get to some of the more recent projects, what, what were some of those early, pro like early projects that maybe set the tone generated some momentum. Yeah, you're, you're, you're totally right. There was quite a bit more of evangelism that was required uh, five years ago, whereas now, as you said, the uh, uh, you know, recent wave really has uh, brought a lot more people kind of to the, to the front door, if you will. Um, you know, but some of the early wins, you know, we've, we've always been super practical, right? Yep. So, uh, and I love how you framed it, right? It's all about how are we uh, delighting uh, our customers and our users. So a couple of the things I would say that we did you know, very early on is, uh, you know, we, we launched a program here at Highmark Health called, um, you know, Think Up. It was part of our overall strategy, which is all about health up, scale up, and then think up. And think up was all, all defined as how do we reimagine how we do work? And for us, that was the perfect frame to go out and say, well, how can we reimagine how we do work through advanced analytics, you know, artificial intelligence, et cetera. And the pattern that I kept telling both my team and the organization was, hey, just look for people that have uh, a scratch pad next to their computer, post-its all over their monitor, because what they're doing is they're trying to go out and find information to then make a decision. And what we're going to do is we're going to go out, find that information for them. We're going to apply some analytics to then suggest some action, and we'll present that back to them to help them. And that pattern really resonated with the organization, it allowed us to tell very granular stories that we could say, hey, you know, nurse case manager Jennifer used to work like this, but now works like this. Um, and oh, by the way, it is, you know, 35 percent more, uh, you know, productive and 20 percent more effective. And so those kind of vignettes yes. turned out to be super powerful for us. And then the, the, the last thing. I'll, I'll say is 2018 was a big kind of watershed for moment for us because that's when we uh, activated our first real-time scoring engine um, that was uh, in workflow uh, with it on millisecond time scale, decorating uh, a particular piece of work, in this case, a prior authorization with uh, you know 10,000 plus variables about a member and then making a prediction that actually informed workflow. So if that prediction was above X, it went to Y. If it was above, you know, below X, it went to Z. And I always joke that the lights kind of dimmed here in uh, Fifth Avenue Place when that uh, when that uh, went live. But that was a big deal because we kind of were proving to the organization that we could do it not only A, in real time, but B, not through an Excel spreadsheet that was emailed to someone, but actually, uh, you know, kind of um, native in the workflow so that it was seamless for the end user. So those two were like really big deals for us. Yeah, th that's awesome. I think um, for everybody in healthcare, they followed both of those perfectly. For those not in healthcare, the second one, can you just a, a minute on what you mean by prior auth? Because that's like a, a term that those in other spaces may not be able to 
land on. Yeah, thank th thanks for uh, thanks for calling out the industry terminology. Please, please do um, uh, continue to do so. So, uh, prior authorization would be um, before a particular, um, in many cases, procedure. There might be um, a authorization that is required, and that authorization could be checking a number of things, making sure that a the member actually has coverage for said authorization, b that it is medically necessary based on the uh, medical policy of the insurance company, all leading to it's going to actually be reimbursed if it occurs, right? right? Um, and this is a process that we want to, A, make sure is kind of seamless and as fast as possible because we don't want to stand in the way of appropriate care. But we also want to use it as an early warning system that something is occurring. And the particular case I was talking about was uh, in many cases, health insurance companies will use paid claims to inform them, but the paid claims might occur weeks or months after a service actually happens. Uh, not the best for uh, actually helping someone navigate a complicated situation, whereas that prior authorization by definition occurs before the procedure. And so the particular prediction we were trying to do was identify things that we thought were going to be very complex. And because of the member situation, other things that are going on, and that enables us to engage early to then help a member navigate. It might help us navigate them to social services that could help them with some type of barrier to care, be it transportation, housing, food insecurity, et cetera. It could be uh, polypharmacy. People often will have challenges if they have four, six, eight drugs that they have to coordinate around. It could be um, navigating multiple uh, doctor visits, et cetera. So that was really the goal is to use that as an early warning system to then help us intervene early. And our, our strategy is all about proactive, personalized, and simple intervention and solutions. So it was really enabling that. Yeah. So that's perfect. And I, my guess is everybody's following now, right? Because we've all experienced this as consumers, but not necessarily with that buzzword. And and it, it's a super exciting, I mean, for what it's worth, 2018 is early, but people are still continuing to get better and better at what we do around this kind of using prediction technology, analytics, AI, machine learning, whatever, but to, to do these things better, right? And and it is one of these examples, I think, where like care is better, the provider has a better experience, the payer has a better experience. Like you can, it's really is these kind of win, win, win opportunities for, for ML. So I'm sure you're not done with prior authorization, but starting in 2018 with real time prior authorization is is early. I mean, that was early in the in the evolution of healthcare, at least for the groups that that I'm that I'm aware of. Let's let's fast forward to today. Um, what's your current uh, portfolio of projects look like, and and how are how are things a little different in in 2024 here? Yeah, so we, we still have a robust um, portfolio of you know however we want to call it traditional machine learning projects. And, you know, in many ways, I feel like those are just seamlessly integrated into what we do because we've been at it a while. Um, and, you know, those are really around, you know, how do we help? Uh, how do we help with predictions? How do we help with forecasting? How do we help with automation? Uh, and that's a very robust portfolio. We're, we're largely uh, organized now around uh, analytic products that are delivering that into the organization that all have, you know, state, uh, all have customers, all have targets, et cetera. And that feels pretty, um, uh, you know, pretty baked into our operating processes. I mean, the brand new thing, of course, is all the generative AI work uh, that is, uh, has emerged. And, you know, we've launched a dedicated program specifically focused on uh, generative AI to really both A, capture the use cases coming in, um, and then be kind of from either top down or outside in say these are some of the transformational things we should be doing uh, the ramp up there has been unbelievable in the first uh, you know quarter of 2023 I think we had 200 plus ideas uh, for generative AI uh, we've been working through the backlog and we'll talk about some of the successes some of the failures there uh, just had a uh, review with the team uh, yesterday uh, on that we have 50 plus that are kind of in, um, you know, kind of production uh, already um, on that. Many are, you know, smaller for sure, um, but but some are, are definitely uh, bigger. And we're still working through an ever-growing backlog uh, and probably will be for a long time as people understand the technology more because I will say it is, um, it's even more intuitive than some of those other uh, traditional machine learning. And what we're finding is the more people engage, the more ideas they have. Uh, which is a nice flywheel, but at the same time, uh, a challenging one to make sure that we can uh, meet that demand. So, I mean, 200 in Q1 of 
2023. If people think ChatGPT didn't change awareness around this, right? Like that's amazing. Overnight. Right. That's a, Overnight. amazing, right? So zero to 200 in a quarter. Uh, and then, so those 50 projects, most of those were started back then. Was it mostly mostly from that original 200 or? Some yes, some no. They, they And they, and important to say, they come in, those 50 come in three forms. Um, you know, form number one is really just the enablement to use uh, generative AI that is kind of, I would say, resident in some application that we already use, right? So a huge use case, of course, uh, marketing is kind of, littered with enormous amounts of use cases anywhere you can go where kind of more content equals more revenue huge huge use cases right so text to image simple create early storyboards for campaigns we don't need to build that we just need to enable enable that so a bunch of those are just the enablement of and making sure that the enablement of uh kind of still works for our responsible ai framework that it kind of doesn't have any uh, challenges from an ethical, legal compliance perspective. So there's a bunch of tranche that are there. Another tranche is working with specialized vendors that might come to us that have a solution that is either you know trained in a very specific domain or corpus or has a particularly challenging set of integrations that we don't think we should do. And then the third, of course, is where we uh, you know decide to spend our own development time to build some bespoke solution. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges I've seen, frankly, is deciding where a use case falls across those options, because we're trying to, of course, deploy our own development capacity at the, like, most specialized, kind of most strategically advantaged. So we talk a lot about being ruthless curators of that backlog. And that's been, uh, that's been hard. Yeah, I was literally, as you were talking about, I was trying to picture myself in your shoes and figure that out. Like, how do you generally think about, okay, this is something we should do bespoke versus use a specialized vendor for it. I, I'm sure the answer I'll give now will be different than the answer I'll give in two months, three months, four months, because we're figuring out, plus the market is moving so darn fast that, because you would love to say, well, you know, this is something that uh, I don't think is going to be available to me anytime soon, whatever it is, right? But it's impossible to predict. So the way that we're really thinking about it is, you know, really number one is value, of course. Is it, uh, you know, is it um, incredibly valuable for us? Uh, you know, of course, a second one is also, are we aware of any current offerings? Um, you know, that's the one that's the hardest to know because the offerings are so vast and changing so rapidly. But, you know, I think the third one, um, you know, that has been most important for us is how much does it require our own data to fuel it. And, uh, you know, certainly those ones that don't require our own data are ripe for some other external party, but the ones that really need to tap into are and kind of be integrated with either our own data or our own uh, legacy platforms. I think those are the places where we see the the most impact because they're the hardest to, to implement as well. Yeah. But by the way, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I want to keep going on this conversation, but I would just say to listeners, I think there's some real business model innovation needed for AI around that as well. Like we, th that should not be driving Richard's decision making process, but clearly given how people are approaching this today, it, it is. And, and I think there's huge opportunities there. So for all the entrepreneurs listening, let's get a little bit more creative about how we're bringing solutions to our, to our customers here. Um, and, and Richard, I don't know if you have any re reaction to that, but I, I do want to get to wins and fails in a minute more more broadly and lessons learned there but no i i i would like just quickly i i agree with you um this certainly is a ripe space for innovation and kind of turning the conversation to to not that would be good i mean the other i guess reaction or or uh, observation i would have for any of the entrepreneurs on the you know listening is you know obviously the easy to demo um, but really hard to implement is incredibly, you know, frustrating for those of us that are, uh, stuck with the executive that got super excited by this thing that they saw and now expect it to be able to be simply delivered in two seconds. And so, um, continuing to, uh, you know, be practical and upfront about what, you know, getting to real production and kind of the definition of done, uh, I think can differentiate some folks versus, uh, just leaning on the easy to easy to demo, right? The the sort of 
Hims effect in healthcare, right? So for those not in healthcare, like there's this conference every year called Hims, and people come back super excited about this thing that shows really well on a trade show, but maybe not as, as easy in in reality. Um, so we've kind of gotten to two lessons learned, I think, already. But I, I am curious, like you've been you've been at this for a while. You've certainly ridden this wave aggressively over the last year. When you think about what's working and and what's not. Maybe talk a little bit about a couple examples and then some some lessons people could take from that would be really helpful, Richard. Yeah, and I, and I think um, I always find that maybe some of the, um, you know, challenges or failures are most uh, instructive. So I'll, I'll start there uh, and I'll start there in kind of two dimensions. So, you know, the, the biggest lesson learned on a failure is the readiness of the data is by far the single biggest um, challenge and thing that we are now doing a much better job of assessing. Um, and it's not just the readiness of the data for the initial idea, but really you got to get deep into it. So I'll give you just a simple example. We had, we had, one of our initial ideas was, uh, hey, let's build a uh, AI assistant for some of our strategy analysts that have to go out and um, collect information about competitor products um, because we'd much rather have them spending all of their time analyzing and um, interpreting the uh, implications of those and not collecting that information. Sounds simple, but it turns out a lot of those uh, product details sit in complicated tables. They sit in images. They sit in things that are not ready to feed into a large language model or a pre-trained transformer. And so uh, now the good news is we learned that. And then the good news is that we kind of failed forward in terms of building uh, table extraction algorithms, you know, really learning a lot about, you know, uh, RAG infrastructure and other, other other things very rapidly, which now will help us in the future. But at the same time, that business area got really excited because the first question they asked worked, but the second, third, fourth, and fifth did not. And so now we're kind of having to manage the emotions of that business unit of, uh, oh, well, maybe this Gen AI is just hype because it didn't actually work. Um, you know, so that was definitely, uh, that was definitely, uh, you know, a lesson, uh, a lesson learned. Um, I think the other lesson learned is frankly one that is the exact same lesson that we've been learning since the start of this journey, which is, uh, you know, business engagement and adoption is still, is still king. Like that is still king. It was with traditional machine learning and it's with, uh, it is with, uh, it's the same with gener generative AI. It's no different. Um, and if we can't get folks to iterate, <laughs> engage, iterate, and have a continuous improvement mindset, uh, it's not going to work uh, because this is not magic. It's not, it doesn't work perfectly the first time. It requires iteration. Um, and so that is still uh, the case. And I think we lost, I'll be honest, we lost a little bit of that because everyone was so excited by the technology that I think we did lose a little bit of focus. We're back now on it. Uh, but it's amazing to me that that's been the continuous thread, you know, throughout. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, I think that's a continuous thread. And I'd actually say on the readiness of the data too, right? Like, that's a good it's point. like, also. hey, like machine learning has always been past as predictive of the future. And so you need to have good, clean, large data sets. And I think, I think this is why you see companies, and, and you're a good example of this, who've been working on this for a long time, not getting caught up in hype, but actually delivering value because they've got the infrastructure in place, right? If you don't have a mature data science organization, you can do some, you could, you know, put a thin wrapper on top of an LLM and you can, you can do some things that feel magical, but th they are going to get to question three, four, five, and then all of a sudden fall flat and then be like, oh, this is hype. Not, not something that's, right. that's, that's really valuable. The, um, I, I was sitting with some other healthcare leaders uh, at a at you know a conference. It honestly doesn't even matter which one because I guarantee ninety percent of the sessions were about generative AI because that's that's pretty much it. And the really great way that this healthcare executive framed it was: once you can fully represent the problem you're trying to solve in data, then it is magic. But getting to that point is a lot of work. And you know, I I totally I totally agree. And oh by the way, getting to that point also requires the engineers and scientists that are working at to really understand the business problem, like deeply, like deeply understand the business problem and deeply understand the business processes, which then goes to the other point of 
in order to understand that you need deep kind of collaboration and connection to the business. So, you know, a lot of those are, are still present and still really important. Yeah. And, and the reality is when you're doing this well, it plugs back into a lot of the classic or traditional ML projects. Like these things are less islands than people, people perceive as well. That's a great, that's a great point. And then, um, that ecosystem right. then still needs to work with the legacy infrastructure that every company, you know, kind of has going, right? Because at the end of the day, it's got to help the person doing the work. And, you know, that person is likely in some system that was, you know, engineered 20 years ago. So uh, those integrations are still very real. So how does the special purpose stuff you're doing around Gen AI fit into the, you, you talked about kind of your analytics projects are, are organized around these kind of core offerings. Like how did, what's the interaction between, between those pieces of your group? Yeah, they, they really start to bump up in the way you were just describing, right? When they need to, so, uh, in, like exactly like you said, we are seeing these, um, new generative AI solutions will need to lev will need to leverage other components that we already have. So be it our natural language processing engine, or they might be calling our, um, endpoints for some of our predictive models or our ID and strat engines. And it has been a really interesting, um, uh, journey because this is becoming just more and more of a team sport. I was kind of just talking about this with, uh, our program lead for our, the generative AI program. I'm like, my goodness, this is such a, I have not had so many interactions with not only all the data and analytics folks, but privacy with security, our infrastructure team, engineering. It is uh, remarkable to me that um, that this is all occurring. And of course, it all goes to these kind of whatever you want to call it, fusion uh, team models or hybrid team model, agile models, whatever, you know, but this is like the, at least for me, uh, the most obvious kind of manifestation of that, um, that, that I've seen to date. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um completely agree. How do you think about it from the other way? So how do you think about the people who are these end users, how much they should be doing versus leaning into to your team to do? You know, I think, so I would, I would answer that in two ways. One way would be, um, our, our view has been, we want them to be starting right now, yesterday, to talk to machines, if you will, right? Because this is going to be part of their job, everyone. And how uh, we do that is going to be, you know, different. And frankly, how folks do that is going to be tailored to their job. And the quicker we can get to that, the more distributed innovation that we can have, I think the better off that we're going to be. So the, the onus on me is to provide them a secure um, pathway to do that. Um, you know, because we're pushing that and thus we want them to then go and do that in a way that again, doesn't have any data leakage or, uh, you know, challenges for us. So that would be one answer is like, go, go, go. If there's one thing that I could tell all of them is just start to, you know, start to talk to machines. It's really important. Um, you know, the second, um, and probably harder, um, way that I want them to do that is also to take a step back and say, well, how is this going to change my workforce? And um, I can't do that from my seat. I don't know their roles. I don't know their work. And really start to ask the question, how much of my work can either be uh, you know, done by AI, supported by AI, or not? Um, and really start to think through that and start to think through how they're going to redesign jobs uh, that uh, take advantage of that and then pull us into that. But I, I can't do that from my seat. Um, and I think it's going to be a really... Um, big challenge for leaders uh, to uniquely be thinking through that for their organization. And it's going to be a big change for us because the uh, usage of AI isn't going to be coming out of some central group, right? It's going to be very distributed and disseminated throughout every uh, area. And that's the right answer. But frankly, it's also a more challenging answer. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love both of those and I've, I've got a follow-up question, but I want to make an analogy first for people. So we talked about this being like the internet. So when I started working, I remember I had a boss two levels up who his EA would print out his emails for him and then he would dictate e emails back to her to, to send, right? And like, there's like, that, that's the email thing. I don't do the email thing. I think people who are like, oh, I'm going to stay away from 
the AI thing are kind of like that kind of like, no, he was close to retirement. He, he fared okay, but I think this is pretty quick. Like you want to be, you want to be thinking through both of these things uh, to make sure you're not, you're not caught into that. I'm, I'm curious, Richard, practically on both fronts, how do you do that? So on the, on the talking to machines point, are, are there tools you're giving them to, to do that? And then on the future of work thing, are there resources you're giving them to help them sort of understand what AI is capable of, what it's not like, just how do you, how do you practically help these leaders do both of these things? Yeah. Um, I, we're certainly not perfect on either dimension and we're, we're, um, pivoting and, uh, zigging zagging as we go here, but on the first one, uh, yes. So we, we have, uh, provided, uh, our internal, uh, team members and we're rolling, um, rolling this out further, our own kind of internal, we call it sidekick or, you know, chat, chat GPT esque, um, uh, interface. And for us, it's really important, especially in healthcare that that is built on our own, um, you know, secure infrastructure that we know there's zero data leakage and we can have confidential information or PHI, pers um, protected health information go into it and it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and so that is one, um, uh, that's how we're enabling the first, uh, and we've seen amazing engagement. It's been awesome to see, uh, not only amazing engagement, we have a, a data scientist in my group is the kind of product owner of that. She holds office hours. I think they're at, uh, 10 AM this morning, super well attended and people talking about, uh, how they use it, sharing. And you know, what we tell everyone is try to break it because that'll help us make it better. So that's how we're enabling one on the second one. Boy, that's a tough, that's, that's harder. Right. We are we are certainly encouraging people. We're trying to do a lot of uh, training, um, uh, both technical training and otherwise to help people understand. Um, and we're certainly providing people, you know, various forums and then chances to talk to each other. But that one's harder. And I don't think I have that one fully uh, figured out yet. Um, and I think it's going to really be a bit of, you know, how HR also kind of evolves to, to help people think through their talent strategies that now incorporate AI into, into that. And I know our team's thinking a lot about that, uh, but that's definitely one that's going to, I think, see a big change over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. Um, both of those are cool. Just on, just on the first one too, uh, for those listening, the next episode after this will be a friend of mine from Moderna who's going to talk about a tool he built inside Moderna that's a lot like their sidekick. And uh, interestingly, somewhat similar profile, I think, to the to, to your colleague. Like he was a data science product manager, built a bunch of so so I, I think that is a if you're not doing that right now, you like you should you should think hard and a bunch of different vendors that can help you do that. You can roll your own, but but thinking about how you put kind of enterprise versions of these things in your in your company makes a ton of sense. On the training thing, uh, you know, I think we are in the first inning here. We got to figure it out. Um, one thing I've found, and I'm curious your reaction to this, Richard, and then we'll pivot to talking more about the future, is vocabulary is really important for a lot of these people. Like, I, I just think a lot of these executives, they kind of know, they've heard the terms, they've read them in the Wall Street Journal, but like just getting them comfortable with like what these terms mean and what's possible and what's not at just a sort of one one level, not at the deep level that you and your team understand it, I think is, is often a way to at least get people off the, off the blocks here. I, I totally agree with you. That really resonates with me. Okay. And I would say not only, uh, which has been another change, not only the kind of C-suite, right. but heck our board, I've done more education sessions with our board than I've ever done on this, uh, before, because yeah. they just have a lot of very valid questions and, really want to understand, like you said, the the state of the possible and, you know, partially just so they can feel equipped to ask the right questions going forward. Um, and I think um, that kind of seeking to understand is a really good sign uh, inside of a company that they're recognizing the level of value and transformation that this can provide. Yeah, this is a board issue, period, full stop. Yeah, period, full stop. Yep. Uh, and I got a lot of the... Uh, well, isn't this just blockchain? And I would talk to a lot of people and be like, you know, we had zero board meetings on blockchain, zero. We've had lots of board meetings on AI. So that in and of itself should tell you it's it's different. Yes, <laughs> yes. This looks more like the internet. So we're going to create yes. a bunch of pets.coms, but we're also going to create a bunch <laughs> of Amazons. And 
that's a that is definitionally kind of a full stop uh, board issue. So, so Richard, I, I could do this all day, and I think I've actually already gone past what I committed to in terms of timing. But I do want to ask one last question, and then we'll do kind of a, a quick wrap up. But when you look forward and think about the future of healthcare and AI, like what are the things that that you're particularly excited about today? Boy, so many, uh, so many, but um, I'll, I'll force myself to give you a short answer. So one, I am so excited to see how AI transforms uh, the patient experience. Yes. Um, I, I think how we experience um, interacting with our clinicians and our care teams is going to be dramatically different. And frankly, I hope people demand that. Right. Um, it should be dramatically different um, through ambient listening, through automatic documentation, through, uh, you know, digital avatars or interface. I just think it's going to look totally different so we can finally start to get to that always on, kind of always available, uh, much more kind of personalized uh, interaction. So that's probably the biggest um, piece of excitement that I have. Uh, I think the second thing I'm really excited about is there's a tremendous amount of expertise mm -hmm. um, inside of the people that work in health insurers and in health systems. And that expertise is often wasted on tasks that do not require that expertise. Yes. And, you know, this is going to allow us to really unleash that um, and hopefully bring joy of practice back to a lot of clinicians being you know, joy of practice back to a lot of administrators that are, you know, burn out by a lot of that. And so I think that's going to be a tremendous, um, so good. a tremendous change. And I think those two things are, they're not like, oh, I hope it's going to happen. I really think that like, those are going to happen and they're going to happen like soon. Yep. And it's going to be pretty, pretty amazing when they do. Yeah, I love that. And you can tell you spent, you know, a decade in finance before, right? Because financial services have, have, I think, in many ways demonstrated this operate where you do the things that you're good at and you let computers do what computers are good at. And I think healthcare is, we're, we're right on the, the cusp of a similar experience. We, we've, um, we've used very effectively this, like, you know, let's enable people to work at the top of their license. Yes. Um, as kind of a, uh, a talk track that I think is really resonated and gets people excited because you're saying, how can, you know, uh, machines propel my kind of work and expertise, so. Amazing, well, Richard, I really appreciate you joining us today. To, to your listeners, like keep track of, keep following along with what Richard's doing on social media, kind of st stay away, aware of that. So to you, Richard, what's the best place for someone to kind of keep aware of the things that you're doing? Yeah, thanks for the thanks for the offer. You know, I I don't uh, I'm not I don't have a huge footprint, so LinkedIn is certainly the place where I um you know um uh public about a lot of the work that we're uh, doing, trying to publish more Great. as well uh, when we have it. So I'd say those are the two two places. And I appreciate you saying that. I hope that we're uh, going to do some amazing things that will get people excited and uh, inspire folks. I I'm sure you will. Uh, so we'll make sure to include. We'll get those links and put them in in the show notes as well so people can jump to the right LinkedIn spot for that. Uh, Richard, thanks again and hope you have a great rest of your day. You too, Sean. I really appreciate it. this. was a lot of fun and I agree we could have gone on for hours. So thank you. 